Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. Hi, listeners. I am so excited because Fairy is back as a sponsor this week. As you may know from listening to previous episodes, I am obsessed with Faraday and their clothing. I discovered this little store in the Pacific Palisades Village Mall in LA, and my husband Kyle and I just went crazy. They have amazing men's clothes and women's clothes that are so soft and great fabrics and colors and everything else, and I have been a fan for so long. So when they approached me to be um, a sponsor, I was like over the moon. Um, um, they even did a little website for me on fairdybrand.com slash Zibby. So go to fairdy, spelled F-A-H-E-R-T-Y, brand.com slash Zibby, and you get 25% off all their clothes, which I have definitely used, and I have to stop at this point, but I keep buying their cozy sweaters and dresses that go with leggings, and um, I have this turtleneck light sort of brownish Heather Gray, I'm not describing it very well, but anyway, um, dress-ish thing that I've been wearing almost every day. Um, Kyle wears these jacket slash polo, um, not polo, button-down shirts, um, sort of indoor, outdoor. Um, I mean, we're stuck in the house anyway right now, but anyway, you have to go get 25% off with code Zibby, fairtybrand.com. Go check out their clothes. You'll see why I'm obsessed. I'm kind of sad to be revealing this little secret brand that I thought that we had only just discovered, but turns out a lot of people know about, and now you do too. So go check it out. And thanks, Fairty, for being a sponsor. Laura Vanderkamp is the author of several time management and productivity books, including Juliet's School of Possibilities, Off the Clock, I Know How She Does It, What the Most Successful People Do Before Breakfast, and 168 Hours. Her work has appeared in publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, and Fortune. She is the host of the podcast Before Breakfast and the co-host with Sarah Hart Unger of the podcast Best of Both Worlds. She lives outside Philadelphia with her husband and five children and blogs at lauravandercam.com. Her latest book, which we're going to discuss, is called The New Corner Office. Welcome, Laura. Thanks for coming back on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books after I mistakenly deleted our episode. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, thanks for having me back and not just leaving it in the trash can. I, I appreciate that. It's so ironic because you're like a time management expert, essentially, in addition to like other amazing skills. And we had this great conversation about like using time efficiently and managing our time and all this other stuff. And then I wasted your time completely by having the podcast not record. So anyway, here we are. Oh, it's fine. And here I was five minutes late to this one because I was using the wrong link. So (laughs) I know I was literally like about to go digging for the time zone and I'm like, really, did I mess this up again? But anyway, these things happen. Nobody's perfect. All good. All good. Okay. So let's talk about your book, The New Corner Office, How the Most Successful People Work From Home, which basically is everybody right now, (laughs) almost everybody right now. Give listeners the lowdown on what this book really helps people do and how you can empower people to work more successfully from home. Yeah, well, I wrote this book after I noticed in March that there were a lot of people who are working from home for the first time and suffering through a lot of really terrible Zoom happy hours (laughs) and that they were probably going to be looking for advice on how to do this long term to work from home both productively and ambitiously. So, you know, I, I cranked this out, got tips on how you can redesign your work days to take advantage of some of the upsides of working from home, how you can handle a self-directed schedule, how you can stay social and build your network when you're working from home, how you can think big about your career and how you can take care of yourself at the same time. I want to hear all of those things. (laughs) Where do we start? (laughs) How do you, how do you stay social and expand your network while at home? Yeah. So it is challenging. I think there's a bit of 
a false view of this, though. I know in the past when people were asking to work from home and negotiating to work from home, that that term implying you need to give something up in order to do it. One of the arguments against it was that, well, relationships are best built face to face. And obviously, when you're working from home, you are then not face to face with many of your colleagues on those days. But very few places going forward from this are going to be 100% virtual. I mean, most places, it's just going to move the needle a little bit on how often it is acceptable to work from home. I mean, most places will not stay five days a week remote for all of eternity once, once this is all over. So in that sense, if you're going to be working from home two to three days a week and in the office two to three days per week, you don't have a problem with this because you'll just be very social on the days that you are in the office and that will be perfectly fine. But in the meantime, there are a couple things you can do. You can certainly begin meetings with a little bit of social chit chat. People are going to do it anyway, so it's good to put it on the agenda for all your meetings because then it's accounted for so it doesn't run over. And it's also, people are expecting it, so you don't get that one guy who's always like, we don't have time for this, and cutting it all off before people have actually said what they meant to say. So that that helps. You can pick up the phone and call people. I think in our world where we have you know smartphones in our pockets, very few people use them as actual phones in the sense that you can call someone. Like if you've been working with somebody for six years, you don't actually have to schedule an appointment at a certain time, trading emails back and forth to be like, would it be acceptable to call you for 10 minutes at this moment? Like you are allowed to pick up the phone and call and that is often the most efficient way. And it's very good because then you hear their voice and talk and all that good stuff. I always find myself apologizing if I call. I have to be like, <laughs> like hey, how dare I yeah. use my phone? Like, I'm sorry for calling. To this person who gave me your number. I should have texted you first <laughs> to see if it's okay. <laughs> yeah. And also I feel like if I call certain friends, they'll think like something's wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I always have to, well, I'm like the school nurse. Like it's okay. It's not an emergency. Yes, it's okay. It's okay first. I mean, I always say, well, that is true. Yeah. Although once you, once you do it more regularly, people get used to it. And so definitely if you're managing people and, and you're working from home, you do need to call your employees frequently so that they don't think they're in trouble every time you call, yeah. right? That's a very important managerial tip here. But I'd actually say that, you know, one of the ways that working from home can be better for network building is that when you work in an office 40 hours a week, a lot of your immediate need for social interaction and for professional networking feels satisfied by the people who you are working with closely. Uh, You go to lunch with your colleagues, you go to coffee with your colleagues, you chat with your colleagues. And that's great, except that the people you work closest with are not the only people in the universe that you probably should be getting to know. And when you work from home, it's not so automatic that you would be going to lunch every day with your colleagues. So maybe you find somebody else to go to lunch with or somebody else to call, somebody else to have coffee with as as that becomes more, that people can do that as we come out of this. So, you know, then you can build a broader network when it's not just enforced by the social norms of your immediate office. And how do you work from home while your kids are around? (laughs) <laughs> well, so this is this is complicated because you know l- before all this happened, one of the most frequent conversations I would have with people who are looking to work from home was the "Don't think you can save money on childcare" <laughs> conversation. <laughs> because some people would be like, "Wait, hey, <laughs> you know, I, maybe I don't have to pay for it." It's like, no, 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 <laughs> you still do. You cannot long term be the adult in charge of your young children during the hours you intend to work. And unfortunately, that reality has not changed just because we're in the midst of a pandemic that has thrown many people's childcare arrangements for a giant loop. So what do you do? Well, the most obvious thing, if, you, if your childcare arrangements are not available or the ones that are available are not acceptable to you, you can trade off with your partner. I have a schedule on my blog from a couple months ago that documents how each party can work either 29 or 31 hours a week. Of those, 25 are pure focused hours. Four to six are sort of probable hours using a combination of nap time and movie time and spouses covering for each other. If you are going to do that, it has to be strictly (laughs) delineated who is in charge. The party who is in charge not only has to keep the kids safe, 
you have to keep them out of the other person's home office. Like that is the <laughs> nature of the job. So that's what you can do. I mean, if, if you're on your, if that's not going to work for your family, maybe there's another, you know, adult in a similar situation that you could likewise swap with. If it's a neighbor or another family member that you're willing to sort of enter into the bubble together with. But you know, I think it's challenging and hopefully people will come to a place where if they need to, they can also find some sort of paid child care that they feel they can trust for at least a few hours a week. Because the honest truth is you will get more done in two hours of focused work while somebody else is dealing with the children than you will in four hours of going back and forth between work and, and dealing with your kids. Yeah. Look how focused I am. And I have a babysitter in the next room. <laughs> well, that's, there you go. I mean, that's what it's got to be, honestly. <laughs> Otherwise they're like over my shoulders and, you know, popping yes, in and yes, whatever else. Yes. Because, although I feel sometimes I feel like guilty, like I'm home. Why do I need a babysitter? Do you like, do you, ever- you, you should get over that. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I hear this from people. And I think it's just a change in mindset because when you're working from home, you're working. The, the operative part here is not at home. That just happens to be where you're doing it. Like you achieve the efficiencies of not commuting to an office. Great, go you. But that doesn't change the fact that you are working and the work still has to get done. And so if you were not available for intense in-person childcare when you were working at an office, that does not magically change just because you happen to be doing the same work at home. All right. Okay. Well, I felt a little guilt, Ebb. Just a little. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and, and you see your family a lot. I mean, a lot of this is, is predicated on feeling guilty that you are, you know, maybe not seeing your family. But uh, I always suggest people try tracking their time if they are feeling that way, because there are 168 hours in a week. You know, even if you are working 40 hours a week, which is a full-time job, if you subtract 40 from 168, you'll notice that there are a lot of hours, hours still there. And, you know, even if you subtract your sleeping hours, you'll notice there are still a lot of hours still there. And you can attract, you know, subtract housework. You can subtract whatever else you want. There are still a lot of hours. And many people do spend the majority of those with the people they live with. So that tends to get rid of some of the guilt. I feel like my kids are experts at using the time that I have designated for sleep. <laughs> they, they want to interact with you during that time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Wait, tell me more because we talked about this last time that I deleted and I was like in awe of your extensive time tracking system and how long you've been doing it and how meticulous and like, like detailed. And anyway, tell me, tell me more about it. Yeah, so all your listeners are going to know that I'm a bit of a time management freak. I have been tracking my time on weekly spreadsheets since April of 2015. And my spreadsheets have the days of the week across the top, Monday through Sunday, half hour blocks down the left-hand side, 5 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. So yep, half hour blocks for five and a half years at this point. I'm not going to bore everybody (laughs) with a recounting of the five and a half years. The truth is it's not terribly exact. I tend to check in three to four times a day. So for instance, when I sat down at my desk this morning, I noted what I had done since about 6 p.m. last night. I will check in probably after this. So maybe, you know, 1.32 p.m. will be another check in, another in the evening, and that's it. And then it will be tomorrow morning again when I check in. And each check in is like 30 seconds to a minute. I'm going to just write down really quickly what I've done. So it's, it's not this big ordeal. It, it takes about the same amount of time as brushing my teeth, which I like to think that a lot of your listeners have also been brushing their teeth quite regularly I, I since April so. of 2015. Yeah. <laughs> <That would laughs> nice. seen. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's along that lines. It's just more data that I'm getting from it. And what have you done with that data? Well, more in the beginning than I do now. In the beginning, I was quite into the analysis of it. I wound up writing an article for the New York Times in 2016 on what I had learned from tracking my time for a year. And, and it was useful because I've, I found some interesting stuff. I mean, I, in, in my speeches for years, I've had some laugh lines about people overestimating how many hours they work. You know, I joke about a guy I met at a party who told me he was working 180 hours a week, which is very impressive when you multiply 24 times seven. So everyone laughs about this. Ha ha ha. And then it turns out when I track my time, I used to think I worked like 50 hours a week because I had tracked my time here and there over the years. And then I realized in the past I had chosen very specific weeks to track like those weeks where I worked 50 hours a week because that is what I wanted to see myself as doing. And when I track a whole year, of course, I can't do that. And it turns out the long-term average is a lot closer to 40, Mm. which is a different number than 50, you know, turns out. (laughs) And, you know, I saw that I was very consistent on sleep. I mean, I didn't get the same amount week to week, but 
over the long haul, I tended to get 7.4 hours per day. So I, if I tracked for two months, it would come out to 7.4. If I tracked for six months, it tra- comes out to 7.4. If I tracked for two years, it comes out to 7.4. So, you know, good to know. These days, it's more serving more of a diary function, I think. Uh, I haven't really added up the major categories in, in quite a while. But I do love that I can look back over a previous week and any previous week from the past five and a half years and see what I was doing. And when I look at those notes, I tend to be able to reconstruct it in my brain. And so that week is not completely gone. It's like the memory is still there. And that has the effect of making time feel a lot more rich and full. So when you're tracking it, how much detail are you putting into, like if I were to say work today, would I then put interview Laura Vanderkam? You could if you wanted to. I mean, oftentimes I just put work and that's the sort of basic email you know, writing an article, unless it's something that I'm trying to track to see how much time I am devoting to. Sometimes I will put the names of people I'm speaking to, like if I'm interviewing or, you know, somebody's on my podcast or I'm on their podcast, just partly to have the names, right? It's the memory. Like I will remember it more if I say, oh, talk with Zibby versus podcast or just work. So sometimes I'll be a little bit more specific, but I mean, there's no rule. It's, it's just for my benefit. So. No, I know. But if, if I were to try and maximize this, if I were to try mm. to do this, I would want to like go all in on like, <laughs> I'm going to spend a week tracking my time. I want to do it the right way. That you- the right way. Well, then, then you might want to be more specific. And if you're only going for a week, it's a little bit easier to do that because you're not worried about the sustainability so much. Mm. So you're trying to make time stand still, essentially. You're trying to like capture the most elusive thing on, on the planet, it, which cannot be captured. Like what, what's this about deep down, do you think? <laughs> Are we going to cycle? Yeah, I do, this? I do. <laughs> so no, I mean, time passes. And once a second is gone, all the money in the world cannot buy it back. And yet our interactions with time are very different depending on what we do with it. And so I have found that recording it makes these years that people say, you know, pass so quickly, feel a little bit more like this, you know, rich tapestry as opposed to a a slick linoleum floor, which is just sliding away. And, And so I do have more memories of the past five and a half years than I would have had if I had not been recording it. You know, I'll I'll still die anyway, but I do have this that I can look back on and and recall. Do you take pictures? I do. I mean, like everyone, you know, I'm just a cell phone. I I (laughs) I take take pictures all I'm taking like 10 a day of my my toast. I mean, you know, it's kind of the curse of modern life, right? It's helpful too. Although there's to some degree, photos are of particular moments and then you can go long bits of time that are sort of not particularly memorable, but there are things you could remember of them. So I I do both. And sometimes it's fun to look back at photos as well. I I think that's something we could definitely spend more time doing too. Recently, my older kids and I were were looking back through the whole iCloud, you know, thing from the past four years. It was amazing to see just how different even they looked in the past four years, let alone their, their younger siblings who are, you know, a baby and then one who didn't exist. <laughs> so seeing that change is, is pretty profound to note the passage of time too. I don't know if you can see, so I'm in my office in New York here. I'm going to just slide this, that, see that bottom shelf is all photo albums. Oh my goodness. Each one has like, I don't know, a thousand. Well, good for you for doing that. And then this whole shelf is also all photos. Well, so many people don't print them up anymore. I oh mean, my that's the, the issue. That was pre-digital photos. Oh, okay. And then starting on that shelf are all my digital albums. So I am like obsessive about monthly recounting in, in photos. So maybe I have the same complex as you in a different way. <laughs> that, that, that probably has a, a good high you know, level view of your time as well. I mean, I'm, I'm sure if you looked back through it, you would see plenty of things that showed daily life then if you're being that good about tracking it. Yeah, I'm trying, but I don't know. So how did you manage to get a book out this quickly? <laughs> well, you just write. I mean, I've written a lot of books, so it kind of flows pretty naturally. I've always been a swift writer. And a lot of the material I was covering was stuff I've been writing about for years. So I didn't have to entirely reinvent the wheel here. I just you know, wrote down some of the tips I had learned. And then I went and found people who had been working from home, running their own companies, or had been working as part of distributed teams for a great many years. 
they had tips so I could incorporate those as well. And, you know, it's a short book. It's, it's a quick read. You probably could get through it in less than an hour and a half. So it's not war and peace. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd have to, we would have to track that though. <laughs> now we're like reading the book is an hour. No, you're like all over my time tracking then this week. No, I'm kidding. Obviously we're at Swellio, but so, and you have lots of kids yourself. How you are do. you, so you, four kids, did I make that up? Five kids. Five, five kids. kids. Oh my gosh. Yes. And a, a baby is one of them, right? And you just one, have- Yes. One of them is a baby. Yes. So it's like four and a half. Four and a half. <laughs> no. Sure. Okay, five, five, <laughs> five kids and you're doing all this writing and you're, tra- I mean, you must- how do you do it? Like not to say, how do you balance it all? Cause it's like an annoying question, but just like, are you just really strict about the, so it sounds like you're really strict about this is what I'm working in. This is what I'm not. But then even in the not working time, managing five different sets of needs is a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's challenging and, and partly it's babies are challenging too, because this year I'm doing it with a lot less energy because I'm not sleeping as well as I would certainly hope to be sleeping. So that is what it is. Babies are tough. They're worth it, but they're tough. And I, you know, I try to get very clear each week on what needs to happen. I spend some time every Friday looking at the calendar for the upcoming week. I have, I try to record anything that is time specific or that's coming up. I put it on the calendar so I know it's going to happen. I spend some time on Friday looking at the upcoming weeks, seeing what needs to happen to be on track for those things, looking at people's schedules, the kids, the different priorities they're going to have. I make myself a priority list for the next week with my top career things, my top relationship things, top personal things. The goal is to end every week with all of it crossed off, which means that I have to make it very limited. And so there is a strict winnowing that goes down through there. And I look and say, okay, well, is, is it possible for all this to happen in the week? And if I'm trying to bite off more than I can chew, then I need to, you know, crunch it down a little bit more so that I can cross it all off. And it definitely has been more challenging the the past few months, partly because when the kids have all been home, there's just more potential for interruption. And so I'm, I don't have the, you know, I haven't had as much sort of open time and space to be a little bit more flexible of when things happen. So, you know, to record, I have to make sure everyone's quiet and accounted for. And, and that's, that's been challenging. But the good news is the baby's in, in childcare right now. The five-year-old we put in a private school that was promising to meet in person and has been. Then the older three started school virtually, but they've been past the first day relatively self-sufficient. I did a lot of Zoom tech support the first few days, but after that, they kind of go and disappear. And I know roughly when they'll come up for their breaks, but I can work around that. <laughs> so it's, it's been the past like five weeks have been so much different than the five months before that. And I just feel sort of like, ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any advice for aspiring authors? I do, which is to write a lot. You know, we, we just can't be too precious about writing. I find that anyone who has a lot of good stuff coming out also just has a lot of stuff coming out and they discover cool ideas by trying different things and then seeing what resonates and then writing more about that or by forcing themselves to come up with, you know, hundreds of ideas of say blog posts per year out of those hundred, maybe, you know, one or two might be a good idea for a book, for instance. But if you were only trying to come up with one or two ideas a year, the odds that those would be really good are, are minimal. So, you know, do a lot of it as much as you possibly can and your quality and your ideas and all that will become better through the sheer quantity of output. Love it. A perfectly quantitative answer. <laughs> I would expect that less. <laughs> I feel like you did really well on the math part of the SATs. Uh, well, maybe. I'm kidding. And the English, <laughs> look at you, and you're a writer too. So, whatever. okay. Anyway, thank you so much. Thanks for coming back on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. You're my only double, you know. I'm so thrilled. I'm honored. I, this is great. <laughs> and I learned new things this time. So it was great. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Well, take care. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Bye bye. Thanks again to Faraday for being a sponsor today. Go to faritybrand.com slash Zibby and get 25% off. Enter code Zibby for 25% off these amazing, comfy winter clothes and summer, but for now winter, and you will thank me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. 
Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thank you.